All right, today's episode, we're going to talk about the glutes, what they do, why they're so important to develop, and what things you could do to give yourself strong, round, amazing glute muscles. That's the butt muscles. Let's talk about that. Hands down, the single most common muscle that people asked to be developed in higher It has to be like the last 10 years. This has to be yes. like the highest... Uh, priority for most. I mean, for my females. my entire career, that was the the num number one, right? So if I had, if I first of all, you have to know that seventy percent of our clientele were female. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them were middle aged women, and almost all of them, even if they said, "I'd like to lose fifteen or twenty pounds," and. I want to build yes. my butt. It was like almost always and build my butt or it was purely like, I just want to build an ass. You know, it's funny. This is the one muscle when you look at uh, like if, if men and women were to list the top four, you know, let's say muscles that they find attractive in a mate. This Equal. is the one common muscle yeah. that you'll find that women will say glutes and men, uh, uh, men will obviously say glutes. And so you ask yourself, why, why do we find this muscle? So, you know, attractive and it's mainly because, and anybody who's ever worked uh, in in any kind of sport or strength sport knows this, that round, strong, powerful glutes uh, typically signifies power. Like you got someone who's fast, stable, like and strong. I, mean, I you thought could, you were going to go the evolutionary route, right? Like for men, isn't it? I mean, if you have uh, like wider hips, it's better for birthing, right? For women. Right. Yes. Okay. So, so, so the, the bigger butt hips thing, I think plays for men towards that way. And then to your point about if you ever seen, yeah. if, a, if a dude has like a big butt naturally, he's probably athletic. He tends to be really a lot good. more powerful athletic and it's responsible for keeping us upright. Yes. I mean, yeah. Part. So, so yeah, there's, there's like body fat storage, uh, that's desirable that men like, which is kind of what you're talking about. Like women who store more body fat, in the lower half of their body uh, tend to be healthier, have healthier offspring. But in terms of the muscles themselves, I mean, glutes are locomotion. It's what allows you to move and be mobile. And if you have poor locomotion, you are not a good partner. You're not gonna be able to have kids very well, take care of them or actually do anything. And it's one, it's one of the muscles that in terms of its size, that's unique to humans in terms of primates. We have like really, really big glute muscles compared to like a gorilla is a huge, muscular animal With flat butt little tiny butts yeah. and it's because what well, you said we walk upright um it's this uh this this, this hip extending muscle it got, allows us for uh you know locomotion and speed and strength and for for athletes like almost every sport you develop stronger glutes you're going to have better um athletic performance and you can always always you can almost always pick out an athlete with a lot of power yeah by having strong it's hips, pretty right? accurate to pick out of a lineup which athlete is probably the most powerful out there on the field. Now, where would you guys rate it on a scale of uh, one being, uh, you know, not difficult at all, 10 being very difficult to develop for most people? Mm. You know what? Like, uh, okay, I think across the board, arms, buys and tries, one of the easiest muscles to develop both yeah. men and women. Um, shoulders, relatively easy, I think. Uh, chest, a little challenge. I think I would say is a challenging muscle mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. many people back to develop. Back can be pretty challenging. Bow back can be challenging. Yeah. I would put glutes up there with, if not the top, one of the top three most difficult muscles to develop for most people. That doesn't mean as a trainer. So take your trainer brain out. Yeah. Not for you, because I think I, I think we've learned a lot of great hacks yeah, you're right. I know and, and ways to help people. Yeah. But I think the average person. It's one of the most common, um, I guess, client that we'll get to that has uh, a hard time like accessing a certain muscle group is I, I very, I very much heard a lot of like female clients, especially coming in and, and they didn't have very good connection with their glutes. Yeah. Well, modern life, um, you, we tend to like underdevelop them and we don't, we're not very well connected to them. So that's why people have, you're right. That's why they have a tough time developing them because they don't connect to them very well. But once you get them to connect, yeah, then they become an easy muscle to develop. Yes. They're very responsive. And that's, that's the thing with the glutes. They're very responsive to hypertrophy when you can train them properly. You can really, and it's a huge muscle, and they have this massive capacity for strength and power and for development. You just have to learn um, how to connect to them. Yeah. So all right, let's break down the glutes, because we talk about glutes, and we just think these two big butt cheeks. But there's actually like three main muscles um, that make up the glutes. You have the gluteus maximus, which is like the big kind of meaty middle part. Then you have the medius, which is kind of this outer upper part. And then you have the minimus, which is a smaller, you know, part of the glute that's underneath the, the medius. 
Now they all are involved in like hip extension, like that's bringing your leg back T to some degree, um, abduction, bringing the leg out, um, rotation to, for the most part. Um, uh, and they all kind of work together. So people who try to isolate one or the other. I mean, you can kind of do that. You little can't bit. isolate it. You can put emphasis yeah. on more of one than the other, but it's like they, they work synergistically. It's not like, it's not like comparing, uh, the bicep to the tricep, right? It's not like you can do exercises mm -hmm. for it and completely not work it at all. Right. Um, the, the, the best exercises for the glutes are going to be ones that allow you to get that hip extension. Uh, with good load, like being able to add a, a decent amount of weight to the bar. This is like all, ex like all body parts, right? The ones that allow the exercise, allow you to load them tend to be the best uh, muscle builders. So um, I'll, I would add uh, also range of motion in that. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it, add good load point. and good range of motion, I think would, would, would be the, the, the king of exercise in there. Cause you know, the air, the, the, the challenge that I always had with clients that, that hired me for this, very few of them like never didn't try something themselves. M most of them thought they were doing yeah. all the right exercises. The most common things I saw were either one, they were doing these shortened isolation type of exercises, you know, kickbacks, dog peas, you know, type of, uh, you know, marching things, uh, extension on the the Stairmaster. Yeah. They're doing all this stuff that made their butt burn. Like quarter rep kind of yeah. squeeze yeah. pumping moves. Yes, yeah. all yeah. these all these movements that 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 made their butt burn. They could feel it in their butt better than maybe some of the exercises that actually built their butt better. Yeah. yeah, it's funny too because a lot of those exercises you said were directed towards the female market because women were you know more aware of hey I want to build my butt. But they're also the common uh, female consumers. Like, I don't want to, you know, build too much muscle overall. So, like, here's some wonderful, yeah. you know, butt building exercises for women. And they're all not the best butt building exercises. They're all these short, like you said, range of motion. almost. Yeah, and I'm no glad resistance. you brought up uh, range of motion because, like, one of the biggest things that I always had to work through with clients like that, like, a lot of times it was a limiting factor of knee pain or, or something, mm. you know, that was sort of restrictive in terms of their depth. And, and so they never really were able to tap in and access, you know, that full range of motion, which then allowed their glutes to contract and fire at that uh, optimal amount. So to to, to kind of work through that and then, um, you know, open up this whole range of potential for them, for their glutes was huge. You know, it's funny too. A lot of people don't know this. This is very true though. One of the most common root causes of low back injury and pain, which is one of the most common injuries. Okay. One of the more common places people hurt is in their low back is actually weak dysfunctional glutes, like weak hips. Yeah. Uh, really place a, a lot of stress on the lower back because what your butt can't do, your spine ends up having to do. Every time you bend over, twist, lift something, move, and you'll almost always, I mean, this is very, very true, not always, but almost you know, pretty common, I'd say a majority of time, somebody who has lots of back problems has some dysfunction or weakness in the glutes. I, that was definitely. Me. I think that was, I couldn't break past 90 for the longest time. One of the things that I realized happened to me when I worked on my ankle and hip mobility, got to a place where I could do a really deep squat was the development in my glutes. Yeah. I got all this great glute de de development and then all of a sudden back pain is completely gone and that's for sure. Of course, working on the hip mobility probably contributed and helped some of that and alleviate some of the, the low back pain, but so did developing the glutes because that's supporting that. Well, yeah, I think of what hip mobility is what muscles are right. being the activated are getting, the most. are getting involved there. It's all glute. It's it's mostly glute, right? So well, it's the, to protect your back, it's really important. Right, and the mobility, I mean, yes, it's, it is a strengthening. It's not just flexibility, but, you know, that really helped to to provide access to that range of motion. Right. And then to strengthen it is really crucial for, it, for you to be able to keep that. Yeah, totally true. All right, today's giveaway, the RGB bundle. That's three MAPS workout programs. If you want to win, you have to enter. Here's how you do it. Leave a comment below this video the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Um, also, this episode is all about developing the glutes. It's about developing powerful, amazing looking butt muscles. Well, uh, we have a butt building program uh, that you can get at mapsfitnessproducts.com and we're gonna make it 50% off for this episode. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com, find the butt building mod. This is a modification you can plug into any workout 
to really put emphasis on your glutes and then use this code for that discount, for the 50% off discount. But 50, B-U-T-T 50, will give you that discount. All right, here comes the show. Best exercises. Um, you know, there's like, uh, you know, hip thrusts have been known to now, are known to be a great butt exercise. And I think that's up there. But um, I, I think barbell squats are still the king uh, of glute development. Uh, hip you, thrust is still number three for me. Yeah, it's still- Even up, with all the popularity- By the way, that doesn't mean it's not good. That's great. No, it's yeah, a great butt three. Build. It's yeah. a top three. And I know there, there's, that's a, there's a bit of controversy around that because of the popularity around the hip thrust in the last decade. There was no debate or argument of that prior to 10 years ago because of the popularity of the hip thrust, the ability for you to load that, people to connect to it in that. It has become a, one of the best exercises to do that. But the one area that it is inferior to the deadlift and the squat is the range of motion. Yeah. You get a greater range of motion and you can load just like you can. They, they all three can be loaded very heavy. Right. Right. So every somebody has the potential to deadlift, squat and hip thrust in the hundreds of pounds for both men and women. So that makes it a, an incredible exercise. But the one limiting factor that the hip thrust has in comparison to the deadlift and the squat is the range of motion. Now, here's why. Here's the, here's one of the reasons why hip thrusts. A lot of people think it's a great. It's the best, not great, but the best butt builder because it's an amazing butt builder for people who have trouble connecting to their glutes. Yes. So if you're somebody who's like, my butt won't grow. I've done squats. I've done deadlifts, and I just can't develop my butt. Hip thrusts become the best exercise because. It's not purely an isolation exercise, but it does connect. It's easier to connect to your glutes with a hip thrust than it is with the barbell. It's squat. the reason why there's so many evangelists around it too, yes. because they're like, yeah. I couldn't build it. Yeah. They couldn't build it forever. All of a sudden they get introduced to hip thrust. Right. Now they can feel it. Now they load it. Now they build it. And then now they go, oh man, deadlifts suck and, and barbell back squats suck for it. It's all about hip thrust. But I would challenge that person that is listening that thinks that, to make sure if you're not already, make sure you're still including the deadlift in the in the barbell squat and see what you get from it now because you're exactly right. The reason why I love the hip thrust so much is because it is a great tool to teach somebody to connect. Somebody who right. can't feel their butt in a deadlift and a squat, then that exercise becomes number one for me. It yes. becomes number one because even if the squat and the deadlift take the muscle through a greater range of motion and you can load as much, if my client has a poor recruitment pattern and they're driving out of a squat or with more quad than they are glute, then they end up just developing their quads and they don't feel much in their butts. And so that means okay, the hip thrust now becomes a superior movement at that time. Yeah, I would say to somebody who um, discovered hip thrust, their butt finally grew, now they're evangelists, I'd say go and now try to get as strong as you can with the squat, and now what watch what happens yes. mm -hmm. to your butt development. So, And now this is true for all exercises. Almost all exercises have the potential to be the best exercise for you depending on, on what you need. But generally speaking, so we're, we're going to speak generally here, Barbell squats are number one. There is no butt building. Actually, there's no lower building, muscle building exercise um, that's as effective as barbell squats. And glutes, you're going to develop. If you have decent you know, movement patterns and you can connect, it's going to build um, great glutes. And then the second would be deadlifts and, and, and deadlift variations. So it's like conventional deadlift, sumo deadlift, stiff-legged deadlift, like all those uh, hip hinging exercises, they really develop the glutes and the hamstrings both together. And yeah. I'm, I'm a bit partial to a sumo deadlift for building the butt only for the reason that what's really common is uh, from training so many clients is recognizing how many people's uh, knees cave in when yeah. they squat. And so that movement, okay, you, you, when you open up your stance like that, it kind of forces you to have to pay attention and to, you have to push your knees out. Yeah, and mindfully push your knees out as you as you go to pull the bar up. That kind of and that lights up the glute med. So that's when you most people notice that. If you notice when you get down into that movement, you put emphasis on pushing the knees out as you come up with the with the sumo deadlift. You're kind of activating that 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 side part of your butt and mm -hmm. lighting that up more. And I just find that that's an area where, that seems to be dormant in a lot of people that can't develop their butt. So, and it's not to say that the sumo deadlift is better than a conventional deadlift or one of their movements. It's a favorite of mine for teaching purposes, just like I would say the hip thrust is a favorite of mine for teaching purposes. I would agree. I would say I would go sumo deadlift for me, uh, conventional deadlift would be second. And then single leg deadlifts are phenomenal. Oh yeah, I love mm -hmm. that too. For the glutes because of you have to stabilize the knee yep. while you're going down and balance. 
And you'll notice two places light up, your ankle or the muscles in your foot and your ankle, and then the, the glute muscles yeah. to try so to control the I'm, muscles. I'll tell you, isometric contraction. Yeah. I'll tell you a scenario where that's my number one is if I have somebody who is is can't load very well. Yeah. yeah. Right. So let's have so let's say they're they're recovering from an injury, maybe they're advanced age, uh-uh. but they still have this goal they want to build their butt. And we're not at a place yet where I could get them to work up to 200 pound deadlifts or something like that. Or they're just they're afraid to hip thrust 300 pounds or something. And I, I know that I could really challenge that glute with a lot lighter mm-hmm. load on a single leg and then and it develop. I love that for that type of person. So if you're a client who can't load for whatever limiting reasons or maybe advanced age or you're a trainer and you're training a client like that, the single leg deadlift becomes one of the best because of the, how how much emphasis it puts on those yeah. glutes with a, a lighter load. Yeah, and it's, it was always the deadlift variation I would do when somebody had a previous back injury that we had to be careful for or were rehabbing. Then we'd want to go deadlift. I would go unilateral, single leg deadlift, very safe. Lots of glute activation. Lower back is in a quite safe uh, position. By the way, when you do that, you want to make sure you keep your pelvis uh, like parallel to the floor because what a lot of people will do is they'll rotate their hips as they go mm-hmm, down mm-hmm. and it changes the exercise completely. So when you bend over, you want your hips to still be straight as you bend over to get the glute to really fire. Yeah. One good thing to do with that too is uh, sometimes like if you have those like furniture mover slides, like you can oh, put yeah. one toe on top of that and try to maintain as, as straight of a line as possible. Like you're drawing a line behind you uh, with that, with that suspended leg. Uh, Cause that does, that's one of the most common things I see is a deviation is the rotation of the hips. You yeah. could actually teach it with that leg on the ground. Yeah. So I've done that before. Somebody who really is challenged with stability. You just lighten the pressure on them. Yeah. So like they're we, just on their toes. That's yeah. right. So the, the, the back foot is on on their toe to help with stability right now. Totally. But then we're shifting all of our emphasis on the on the front leg and then but still hinging as if they were on, on one leg. Yeah. And just, you know, you know, not, not to go off too far on this, but unilateral exercises um, are really good at highlighting imbalances uh, between the right and the left. And if the imbalance between the right and left gets too high... Uh, and it doesn't have to get that high for this to happen, injury risk goes through the roof and, or your body will start preventing you from kind of being able to add strength. So, you you know, for somebody listening, who's like, oh, single leg deadlift, he said back injury, he said rehab, he said connecting, I'm strong, I deadlift a lot, I squat a lot, but you know, maybe I've plateaued. Try the single leg variations because you may have plateaued at whatever weight you're lifting in those lifts, because the right and left side are uh, super I'm balanced. so glad you said that. I'm going to take it even further and say, not only try, I think it, it's necessary if you've ran, let's say, six months plus of nothing but bilateral yeah. stuff, because it, it almost all of it, none of us are perfectly symmetrical, and, and there's always an imbalance a little bit. And when you are continuously, progressively overloading the bar, that's when injury potentially occurs and or this like excessive overdevelopment on one side or the mm-hmm. other because it's inevitable that one side's a little more mm-hmm. dominant. That's actually one of the key indicators for me that I need to go back to some unilateral work is when I've been pushing my barbell squat or my deadlift or one of those big movements and I start to notice either nagging on like tightness on one mm-hmm. side more than the other side or even I can see see a physical difference in development on one side or the other. That's always oh, a yeah. sign for me to go, go unilateral it's work. It's subtle, but I mean, and it, a lot of times, like uh, when you start s- substantially adding load too, you can mask a lot of, you know, the weaker side versus the other yep. side. And and when you uh, go down to uh, unilateral training, it really reveals like how drastic the discrepancy and, is. And you're going to, what you'll see, which is if you do it and you're diligent about it and you're consistent with it, where you go, okay, I'm going to commit to, and I know you just came off this kick not that long ago, Sal, where you're like, oh, I'm not going to barbell yeah. deadlift and squat for a while. I'm going to do all unilateral work. What you'll see is, and, and especially if you work at it consistently enough, you'll get really strong unilaterally. You'll go back to your bilateral. You'll be not quite as strong as you probably were when you left off, but then you'll surpass what Very you were quickly. before. And that's so, what happened to me. And then guess what? Muscle will pile, come on again. So that's a, that's a great strategy, regardless if you are you know hindering some sort of injury or your advanced age, that's still a great strategy to include unilateral work. Yeah. Sure. And, and you know, here's a little, you know, here's your clue uh, about what we're talking about. You almost never have uh, the same joint on both sides hurt. It's always one side. It's mm-hmm. always at my left knee, my right hip, my low back on the left side. 
And that's because of the imbalance, right? If everything was perfectly balanced, you see this kind of symmetrical like injury pattern. We fall into patterns. Yes, yes. So so the unilateral stuff is great. Great muscle builder, also great to, to connect to. But overall, barbell squats uh, is the king of, of butt builders uh, and, and for functionality as well. So if you're, if you're let's say we're, well, because I kind of want to build somewhat of a routine for the listener who doesn't, let's say, have a MAPS program or whatever. And we've agreed that hip thrust, deadlift variation, squat variations are three of the king exercises. We know that the what the research says, two to four times a week as far yeah. as the frequency that would be in there. How would you how would you program that into a week? Because obviously heavy loading all three of those in a week is probably too much for the average person. So would you modify uh would you modify the intensity and do all three of them? Or would you say each one of them would be on a different week that you heavy load them and then complement them with oh, other movements? So here's the beauty of those three exercises is you could, you if you train, this is for the average person, decent recovery, no big injuries. Let's say you train Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This is a great order. Barbell squats on Monday, um, hip thrusts on Wednesday, and then your deadlifts on Friday. And it's a great sequence. You get two days uh, of rest from the deadlifts to the squat. I love that you have an gonna... isolation in the middle to kind of give your back a little bit of recovery. Yep, 100%. Before. And you could load them all hard. You could, you could mm -hmm. have, those are three kind of hard workout days with all those three lifts, probably starting your workouts out, right? Because yeah. it's kind of lower body, big lifts. And that you don't have to really manipulate the you know intensity too much because that's that sequence seems to be very safe. Now, if you mix them up and I did deadlifts and then barbell squats, like Monday deadlifts, Wednesday barbell, we start to yeah. see some, you some might issues. be a bit fried. So yeah, you gotta be careful. In yeah. that okay. So, okay. So we, that's perfect. Now uh, we talk about rep ranges, all rep ranges, build muscle. You've made that case totally. a million times, anything from one all the way up to 20 plus, you could even argue all the way up to 30, but let's say one to 20. So we've established Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that you're going to, you're going to load those that we're going to do those as the primary, the movers for the glutes that week. Uh, what do you say? Three to four weeks consistently stay in a rep range and then move into another rep totally, range. Totally. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, it's what you find. If you follow a maps program, you'll see this trend in a, in a lot of our programs is we'll have rep ranges. And this is, this is not the only thing that goes into phasing uh, the programs, but one of the key things is the rep ranges. So, you know, weeks one to four, you're training low rep ranges. So like, let's say three to five, okay? Or three to six. And then the second block would be, let's say like eight to 12. And then the third block would be maybe 15 to 20. Now, someone might be asking, why not mix up the rep ranges throughout the week? You could do that. The problem is, is that, and if you work, once you start to work out for a while, or for those people who have, um, you know this, it's a different mentality and it's a different feel and a different skill to lift properly in low, mid-range, and high-end reps, right? So low reps, it's about the movement, it's connecting, it's generating force. Mid-range, I'm more kind of feeling the muscle. Higher range, it's all about the pump. And so it's a different uh, mindset that goes into it. And you're training your mindset and how you work out just as much as you're training the muscles themselves. So my experience phasing with blocks gets the most out of uh, people in terms of progress. I also think yeah. for an educational purpose, I think it really helps you peer into how you respond to certain things and certain stimuluses. We're all yeah. uniquely different, right? So, you know, some of us, uh, when we do these heavy movement or do these movements, man, I, when I do 20s, my body just responds. Yeah. Or some of us, Sal talks all the time, boy, I, my body, my legs just respond to the three to five rep range, right? So it really helps you peer into what kind of responder you are and, and or what maybe you've neglected. And so when you kind of mix it up every workout, which we know what the research says, if you compare them in a six to 12 week study, it's pretty much the same thing as if you were to phase it every three to four weeks, or if you were to just make sure you incorporate all those every single workout. But the one thing you don't get is, oh, great, I got these great results over the last uh, three months. Well, what, what really, yeah, what helped yeah. the most, what helped the least, what did I need the most improvement on mm -hmm. and staying focused on a rep range and phase and a mindset, like Sal was saying for an extended period of time, say three to four weeks, gives me that ability to really peer in to how my body responds to this training. Yeah. There's a, there's a big psychological component to that too, to, to really like go in for like your lower uh, set, your lower range of reps and, and really like hype yourself up to, to be able to generate that kind of 
force and to, to be able to have the right intention uh, going into those workouts and to consistently do that. It, it takes quite a few of them to really get into that rhythm and that mode. And the same thing in the high rep range is completely different uh, operating system that you're you're bringing into those workouts. So to, to be able to kind of stay there, get good at it. That's it. And yep. uh, and then move on once you reap the benefits. Well, let's 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 talk about that a little bit because we kind of we, we do go over that a little bit in other episodes. But let's talk about that for the person listening to this specific episode. What is your mindset when you are lifting three to five reps? What is your mindset when you're lifting eight to 12 reps? And what is your mindset when you are lifting 15 to 20 well, reps? Low, the low reps, you are looking to be stable. Uh, you're looking to generate force, controlled force. You're psyching yourself up. You're anchored. You're anchored. It's not about feeling muscle squeeze and burn. It's about perfecting the movement. Like power lifters yeah. who train yeah. in this power old time. strength. Yeah, they don't go Load. bench press and think feel the chest, right? They're like, let's maximize the leverage and technique to lift the most amount of weight. Totally different feel than let's say like on the other end of the spectrum, which would be high rep. With high rep, I'm trying to find a way to pump as much blood into the muscle. I'm trying to build some strength stamina mm -hmm. in the muscle. It's like a way different mindset, way different type of workout. It's a lot more of the feel of it. It is. And then in the mid-range- It's a blend. Uh, it's, it's a almost, blend. It's almost yeah. a blend. It's a blend. So it's a nice progression. And you'll find, here's what will happen. I love this too. When you change into a new phase, that first week, you suck. Then the second week, you start to get it. The third week, you get good at it. And then you get to move into a new phase. So it makes it um, you know, kind of a fun way uh, to train. But you know what you mentioned, Adam- uh, about, you know, parsing out what really works for you and what really doesn't. Um, because we're, we're generally telling people three to four weeks in each phase. I mean, you might do be, you know, do better with a six week phase of one of those rep ranges mm -hmm. and shorter week phases of other rep ranges. How would you know that? Right. If you mixed everything up when they do scientific studies, they always change, they'll change one thing and keep everything else the same. They're not going to change five different things because mm -hmm. then they don't know what the effects are, uh, you know, that are happening. So if you want to figure yourself out and really know how to train your body to maximize progress, you got to establish a baseline. That's right. You want to do it that way. So, Agreed. um, yeah, so that's why you want to do that. And then frequency, you know, two to four days a week is, uh, is best for most people. Uh, I like three, I think I would say probably 80% maybe 85% of people watching right now, three days a week of frequency is probably perfect. I mean, that's what we, this is what we laid out, right? Spot. We yeah. just laid out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yep. those three movements. That would be a frequency of three times a week. Now, what about uh, total sets for the week? So we have the, the, the hip thrust is in there. We have the barbell yeah. back squat and we have the deadlift. How many sets? I'm saying I'm doing four to five sets to each of those. I, yeah, I go three to five of each, okay. right? But, you know, um, one thing we didn't touch on were all the other butt exercises, all the other their isolation movements. Mm -hmm. They're not great muscle builders by themselves, but they do have some value, right? If you have trouble connecting to your glutes, they're, it's a great way to start the workout. Get yourself to feel the muscle. Then when you go to these big uh, movements, you know what to look for with your technique. You know what you're aiming for. And this is a big deal. Like this, this is priming, but we did this years ago with clients when we found them having trouble connecting to like lats or pecs or... <laughs> whatever, we would get them to kind of feel it with an exercise where it's hard not to feel it. And then they'd move on to the compound lift and then they'd know, oh, that's how I got to feel that particular muscle. So we have to explain kind of what that looks like. Cause I think a mistake that when I've communicated this in the past, I catch clients doing is they then turn that exercise into a fatiguing type of no. exercise. Yeah. Again, thinking more is better. And really all you're trying to do is to connect to the glute. So let's use an example, a great example of this. Okay. You got barbell back squat is the first day of your glute stuff. That's what we program. What we're saying we're programming is an ideal exercise, but you already know you're the type of person of man, when I do squats, I never fill in my butt. Okay. So I'm going to have you get down on the floor and you're going to do floor bridges and we're going to do five to 10 reps with emphasis of the squeezing your butt at the top. Connect. So you connect and yeah. fill it. You could probably do 30 to 50 of those reps, but I just want you to do like 10 really good ones where you squeeze and only two, maybe three sets of that. That's it. Body weight. Yeah. Are you able to feel it now? Are you able to really activate it? Yes. Once you get there, then you go do your barbell squats and then seek out that feeling. That's right. And I'm not, I'm not trying to get you sore from that exercise. I'm not trying to like get you fatigued, sweat or make it burn or make you go, Oh my God, I couldn't get any more out. Like, 
we want to leave uh, we want to leave gas in the tank because the exercise that's going to give you the greatest return is that squat. If you go in, you do these exercises as uh, these where you exhaust the muscle so much, you actually make it a worse muscle. Yeah, then, and, and you can then like let's say you could load. Let's say if you're fresh, you could barbell back squat. Let's say 185. Then I have you do these floor bridges, and you can now only do 125. Well, that that's not doing much for us. We're losing out on that load. So you want to do just enough to kind of prime the glutes so you can. Yeah, it's more of a mental thing than it is a physical. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and you take it a step further. If you really fatigue the glutes uh, and then you go barbell squat, your body may actually move away. That's right. From activating your glutes because they're tired. Right. And might actually make you use more quad. So if you do them at the beginning of the workout and you're using isolation exercises, the idea is to connect and yeah, feel. Just to stimulate them. That's it. Now, if you do it at the end of the workout, now you can start adding fatigue. So now you prime, you get into your main muscle builder, barbell squats. Let's say you do three sets of that. And then you want to add a little volume with some isolation exercises. Well, now you could train them like a bodybuilder and you can really just use them to add volume, but not too much damage because one set of squats requires a lot more recovery than let's say three sets of, you know, hip abduction, you know, abduction with a cable or something like that. Right. Yeah. I feel like the only way I'm really doing a lot of these other movements is if for some reason, let, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm there's a client training themselves the the next day or two they recognize that they didn't get enough out of that barbell back squat the day before like they didn't feel any nothing in their glutes and then so maybe i'm going to add some of those like like how we have in maps aesthetic where yeah. we have these like focus days where again we're trying to connect to the glutes we're trying to get a little bit more frequency of the glutes but really these three big movements, if you can get connected to the butt and you can load these suckers and you can train them the way we're doing, th the amount of glute development you're going to get just from that alone is amazing. Oh, 85 to 90 percent of people watching right now, you just did the barbell, you know, the, the squat, the deadlift and the hip thrust and you did three to five sets of each best results ever. You add anything, you're not going to get any faster results. There is a 10 percent out there. Advanced people can add more volume. They've got great recovery. They've been working out for a while. We're adding volume like this can be somewhat beneficial, but most people it's like, just get better at those, those three exercises. I'm glad yep. you said that because that, and that's why I would lean away from it is because the tendency that we, people have when you tell them this and you go, Oh, you could do these like, you know, dog peas and kickbacks and these other, you know, uh, you know, floor bridges and all these other movements to, mm -hmm. to work the glutes. If you do that on the off days, right. The other days to a point where that does fatigue or get right. you sore. And then you go to do your deadlift day and you can't load the bar the same as you could the previous week. Then you're, you're hindering your results. You're spending 10 bucks to get five bucks. That's back. right. Yeah. So you got to be able to pay attention to that. So if you are somebody who believes you can add volume and do more glute exercises throughout the week, another day or two other days of lower intensity, make sure you're paying attention to, is that hindering the next big? Cause those, those three big, that that's your core. Those those three big that we laid out as Monday, Wednesday, Friday as your big glute developers. If the other little stuff you're starting to do is taking away from you being able to load that bar on those other days, then you're better off not doing it than adding it into your routine. Totally. Um, now, total sets per week. These are the, all the sets that you did for the week uh, for the glutes for working sets. OK, now I'm going to give a range here, but I'm also going to say this because I know what's going to happen. I know people are going to hear my range. And they're going to think the low end of the range is, you know, builds m less muscle and isn't as doesn't work as fast as the higher uh, end of the range. It's not true. The vast majority of people listening right now, even those of you who've been working out for a while, even those of you that go to the gym on a regular basis, are probably going to get better results on the lower end of this range. Okay, the people who do better at the higher end, you're talking about people who are really advanced who really have incredible recovery, probably already are pretty developed, and they're just at that level where they need uh, a ton of volume. So this range is, and the studies will show, and so I'm going to give you kind of like a mid range because some show a little higher, a little lower, but about 9 to 16 total sets per week is what you're looking at. 9 to 16. Which is basically 3 to 5 sets of those three big movements. I mean, you, that's what we said, right? 100%. Yeah. And, you know, I'd take that a step further. The goal, and you've heard me say it on the show so many times, the goal is always to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. So even if you think I can handle 16, and even if you can, like the other thing that Sal says I love all the time, just, just because you can handle it doesn't mean it's necessarily optimal. Right. So just because you can technically do 16 sets in the week doesn't mean that the, the results are going to come any faster for you. So you're far better off 
going towards the lighter end, starting off with just three sets, so basically nine total for the week, seeing how your body responds, it probably will respond. Stay there for a little bit before you start to add because the, if, if you do all of it up front, you have got no, no room to go, and then you end up tipping over when you start getting in the 20, 30 right, plus sets. Right, there's an optimal dose, and then there's the most you can handle, and they're not the same at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, as you go above optimal dose, you'll build muscle slower and you'll get slower results, but you can handle it, but you're getting worse results. So if you just like to work out for the sake of working out, I guess that's okay. But if you want results, uh, aim for optimal. All right. We got to talk just briefly about diet because if your diet is off, you can do all the stuff that we just said, and you're going to build zero muscle, um, because your diet isn't able to fuel the muscle gains you're looking for. So number one, the uh, building you have to eat more calories than your body's burning. Otherwise, your body has nothing to use to build. So you have to be in somewhat of a bulk. It doesn't have to be a big bulk, but you still have to eat a little bit more calories at least than you're burning so you have extra fuel to build. Say it louder because that is the number one yeah. mistake that, you know, go back. I said all the average client that I got like this, middle-aged woman trying to build, she also tend to want to lose 15 pounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're in this mindset of, oh, I want to lose weight. And so they're going to eat in a caloric deficit, but then I also want to build my butt. Those are conflicting messages sending to the butt. And okay. also doing a million reps of an <laughs> yeah. unaffected. Right, right. Another conflicting message, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you want to build the butt, which by the way, almost everybody, even the clients that want to lose 15 or 20 pounds, we always recommend you build your metabolism first before you go into a cut anyways. Mm -hmm. right. So when I would get a client like that, say, oh, great. Let me tell you what we're going to do first. So I'm definitely going to shred the 15 pounds that you want. We're going to focus on building your butt, building muscle, and building your metabolism. Mm -hmm. And that's going to, to speed it up and make the fat loss part and the leaning out and the flat tummy thing a lot easier. So let's eat in a calorie actually surplus. Let's fuel these the exercises that we're going to do. Let's grow your butt. And then I'm going to lean you out. Yeah, to put it plainly, you can't build muscle without eating enough calories to do so. Okay. Fact. There's another part to this though. And the other part is you have to, uh, not have to, but you will get superior results eating a high protein diet than one that's just low protein. So what's considered high protein for most people, it's roughly, you know, 0 0.6 to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. I always tell people aim for one gram because most people can't hit it and they tend to fall within that range. That, by the way, doesn't make a little difference. It makes a huge difference. Two equal calorie diets with the same workout, same person, same lifestyle. The difference between them is high protein and low protein. You will see significant difference in muscle and strength gain in the high protein group. So there you have it. You got all the things you need to build an incredible butt. Um, try them out and you will succeed. Look, you can find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump DeStefano. And you can find Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique.